Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. This week, I am delighted and honoured to get a chance to chat with Renee Schulz jacobson Renee was a teacher for two decades and she is now an author, artist, advocate and coach. And in this interview, we discuss her book, Psychiatrized, Waking Up After a Decade of Bad Medicine, which was released this year. The book is a beautifully written account of Renee's experiences being prescribed the benzodiazepine clonazepam for seven years. It talks of her experiences taking the drug as prescribed, but perhaps more importantly, also tells of what happened to Renee as she made attempts to withdraw. Renee, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today for the Madden America podcast. And we're here to talk about you and your book, Psychiatrized, Waking Up After a Decade of Bad Medicine, published this year, I believe. And the book describes vividly your experiences of ill-advised psychiatric drugging and polypharmacy and so much more. And before we, we hear from you, I have to say, in reading it, I I was particularly struck by how beautifully you write about such awful experiences. Um, so to, to kind of get us going, I think it was in 2004 that you were um, initially pres prescribed a succession of antidepressants for what was called anxiety-related insomnia. And this was followed by a, a benzodiazepine then. So could you talk to us a little bit about what led to that initial prescription? Yeah. First, I just want to say thank you for having me. You know, I really do appreciate this opportunity to share my story. So when you're asking me about what, what uh, led to the initial prescription, I feel like that's always kind of complicated. I mean, if you wanted me to be reductive, I could say insomnia, but um, I'm going to be a little bit more full with my explanation. Um, honestly, I feel like we all experience trauma in our lives. You know, it's a cumulative effect and you just don't know how much you can tolerate until it bubbles over. So I would just say that in my life, in my young life, I understand now that I actually had some uh, pretty unusual experiences. I, I lived through a, a pretty serious burglary when I was very young that left me very scared about staying alone in my house, um, never dealt with, right? I um, also had some experience growing up in a family where um, my mother was very dysregulated emotionally. She would rage and she would belittle me and she was doing the best that she could, but it wasn't very great at certain times. And she would hit me and um, call me names. And that takes a toll. You know, we're not talking that was one time. That's my entire zero through, you know, 18 years. I would also then add that uh, I was brought up in a religious community where I was brought up Jewish and, and leaning more toward a, a conservative, you know, very traditional conservative upbringing. And um, the expectations for girls and just for everyone were very clear. And it was very clear how I was supposed to behave. And it was not really who I was at my course, in my core self, but um, that did some damage. And then I went to public school and I think that almost every woman in our society, you know, I've asked people at talks to raise your hand if you've ever had, you know, had to deal with some sexual um, misconduct or, you know, harassment and every hand goes up. And so, you know, I was manhandled by teachers, um, boys in the school, and people kind of made it sound like, oh, you're being too sensitive. This is just the way it is to be a girl in the United States, you know? And so there were a lot of things where when I would try to question them, I was taught there was something wrong with me, something, I was too sensitive. I was, you know, this is just the way that it is. Don't question it. Um, and then I would just add that the, the, in, when I was um, 17, I actually was raped by someone that I knew and tr trusted and quite honestly, someone that I loved very much. And um, there was no term for date rape back then. I used to be taught that I was taught that like rape was um, you alone in a forest with a stranger with a weapon. You know, that's what rape was. And it, it wasn't that. 
but it was not consensual. And so this was something, again, it was a second time that I went to my parents and said, this happened. And I was met with those very stereotypical responses of, what were you wearing? What were you doing? Why were you out? You must have done something. Did you even try to get away? Did you, you know, all those things. And so very blaming me. So when you ask what brought me to the medication the first time, those are all the things that were in the background. The precipitating event, however, was in 1999. Well, I was pregnant with my um, only child, my son, Cal. And um, it was an absolutely very difficult pregnancy from the start. Um, I was on bed rest several times because of different issues during the um, pregnancy. And I just wanted this baby, you know, and it's so scary. You know, there's this person inside of you and you're, you're the ecosystem for that person. And I just wanted him to get here. And it's so scary to have numerous occasions where you're bleeding or there's, um, partial abruption. So, um, I, you know, I was already quite nervous about this. Well, when he was born in 1999, it was a really bad delivery and the delivery resulted in my losing almost 75% of my blood. Um, I was rushed into a, an emergency surgery where they were actually planning to do a hysterectomy. So I went to go to an emergency surgery and my newborn son was taken to an ICU because he had stopped breathing. And it was really scary while I was in the surgery, um, which by the way, did not end up being a hysterectomy. It was just turned out to be a DNC, but um, I had an out of body near death experience and it was terrifying. Now people have said to me that this experience it's probably because of the anesthesia, you know, the, the people give me all kinds of scientific reasons, but it's not the way I experienced this. And so I just had this complete experience of me hovering over my body. I watched myself below. I saw a basin, a pink basin filled with blood. I saw the top of my t- doctor's bonnet. You know, I could see the top of her her head and I started floating across the room, which felt like into a, into a tunnel. And, and I could just see the bottom part of my body kind of disappearing through this tunnel. Um, it was really scary. And I remember trying to hold on to the edge of the, of this tunnel, not wanting to go in and just realizing this is it. This is me. I'm not going to be a mother. It's all over. And the next thing I knew I was in my body and just kind of looking up. And my first words were, am I dead? I was strapped to a bed and I had two boards. I I still don't really know what that was. Two boards on my arm that I was receiving some kind of fluids and a nurse popped out and she just said, well, you're not dead at all. You know, you're, you're fine. Her first words really to me were you're fine. And I wasn't fine. I wasn't fine at all. And that sort of started the whole problem was people telling me that I'm fine and that I should be fine. And I wasn't fine. You relate vividly in the book, you know, the the, the trauma that you experienced during that difficult birth. And, you know, I've heard people say even completely normal run of the mill birth can be quite traumatic, but unacknowledged trauma because the people dealing with you have seen it hundreds and hundreds of times, but you haven't as a as a, a new mother or a new father. And so, you know, I, I'm absolutely not surprised that you came to a point in your life, having experienced all that, where you absolutely could not sleep at all. Yeah, I, it was, it was really uh, difficult to um, sleep after that. And I wanted to talk to my husband about these things. I've always been someone, I'm sure you can tell, I process my, my thoughts through, through talking to someone else. And that's just how, how I have always been. I was a teacher. I love the exchange of ideas. And um, my husband was just not interested in this dialogue. He is a, he is a doctor and he was like, you know, why are you focusing on this? The baby's fine. You're fine. 
can't you just move on? And, and I got a lot of that. I got a lot of that from his family. I got around that, a lot of that from other people who were nor- like just telling me it's all this is normal. Mother, new mothers can't sleep. New mothers, you know, are tired. This is to be expected. But I really started to hear voices. Um, I was having auditory, what people would call auditory hallucinations. I mean, honestly, I hear things all the time now. Now I just know to listen to them better. But I was um, having these uh, experiences where I, you know, I'd say, do you hear that? You know, do you hear that? And, and it was very scary and they would happen at night. And I was definitely making these, I was perseverating. I I was making mental lists at night, but I just couldn't relax. I I knew the baby was going to wake up and need to be fed. And I, my partner was not wanting to talk to me. And so I just felt really alone with it. When I think about it now, it makes me like pretty emotional that I was isolated for many months all by myself, no visitors, you know, holed up in bed. I had this personal care aid, but she wasn't interacting with me. And it really was kind of like solitary confinement. Um, That's not okay. People need to be with other people. So it's only now that I have that perspective. Yes. So I, I ended up having some pretty terrible insomnia and my husband, who was a doc, who was a doctor, he, um, recommended that I, you know, one night I woke him up one time too many. And he said, this is just crazy. You need to get some help. Something's going on here. And you, you got to get some help because there's nobody, there's no sounds, there's no whispering and this can't keep going on. So I went to go see my primary care physician. And uh, initially it was, it was a, a few different antidepressants in short succession, wasn't it? But, but then you came, then you came to be prescribed what I think you refer to, he called a baby dose of a, a benzodiazepine. So how did that kind of feel, you know, when, when, cause I think you, again, you described that, you know, you, you weren't someone that was given really to relying on medications for this kind of stuff. So were you worried about that? So I was first prescribed, um, I believe the first thing that they gave me was Prozac. And um, I immediately started twitching and getting, you know, just, it was a very manic response. I, I was agitated. And and the first thing that the doctor said was, it takes a lot, a little bit of time for this to build up in your system. And so I tried so hard, two weeks of just this jitter and I was sleeping less. And so I went to see him and he said, well, So, you know, it's really about finding the right drug for you. So let's take you off of that one. And now we'll try another one. So yes, there were a series of three attempts with antidepressants. And at that point, I was a mess. I mean, we're talking about probably about three months on and off of different drugs. And now I'm sleeping even less than I had previously. And that's when the doctor said, well, you fit. And this is what he said. You failed three attempts with SSRIs. I had failed. I had failed. And so he said, so that means you're going to be a candidate for, you know, I'm going to give you this other, this other medication that's going to break the cycle. And truth be told, I wanted that cycle broken. The first prescription was like five pills just to break the cycle. And it was like, it worked. I went to sleep. I wasn't agitated. I, I got the first quality sleep I'd had in, in a long time in years at that point. And I was like, oh my gosh, whatever that is, this is miracle. It is, I called it a miracle. And, um, I called him and I said, um, you know, can you continue to write me for that medication? And he said, well, I can't, but I will refer you to someone who can. And that's how this cycle started because, um, I trusted my primary care physician. As I recall, he, no one said anything to me about this being causing dependency, having withdrawal. Um, and in fact, the psychiatrist who eventually prescribed for me longer term, he actually said to me, benzodiazepines are great for weight loss. I just had a bit, ba- you know, I'd had a baby and, and he said, you know, it's great. One of the, you won't be, it, it, you might even lose some weight. Well, who doesn't want to maybe lose a little weight, you know, in our culture. So anyway, that is what brought me to, to clonopin, clonazepam um, at the beginning was stopping the cycle of those SSRIs. It's incredibly powerful, isn't it, to to sleep after the period of time that you hadn't slept and to take a drug that 
for the first time gets through that and allows you to sleep and that that's the start of you know obviously there's there's physical dependence on these drugs but there's psychological dependence too and and when you've found something that helps you temporarily you you start to become attached to it don't you in a way yeah and i guess what i would say now is and i do say this to people if someone had said here's a bottle of jack daniels just drink that until you black out I would have looked at them and said, what are you talking about? I I would never have done such a thing. But this little baby dose that was so low, that what do you think I was doing? I was, I took a pill to black out. It's the same neurotransmitters. It's the same process. It just is a little cleaner, right? And I went to a very nice doctor's office and, you know, got a lovely little bit of help. So this was a stunner for me, a stunner. I didn't recognize it as a dependence. I thought that this is just what you do. You go to the doctor. And I'd all, I was married to a doctor. I trusted doctors. There was no reason to question that this person was doing something that was helping me. So, um, Renee, you write in the book that you wanted to stop the clonazepam after, I think, about nine months. So what was there anything in particular that made you want to stop? And, and what kind of support did you, did you get, if, if any at all, in coming off? I wanted to come off of it after the nine months point because I started to have some very weird dizziness that I, that, that was so bad that sometimes I'd actually have to hold on. It would be like an episode. I'd have to hold on to a wall. I started to have a lot of infections. I got yeast infections and bladder infections. And I had just all kinds of strange things that I had never had before And I attributed it to the drug. I mean, I wasn't doing anything else. I was exercising. I ate right. Um, The only thing I could point to was that I was, this is the only medication that I was taking. And I thought, I wonder if this is connected to the medication. So when I went to go to ask, inquire of the psychiatrist who was now prescribing, he said, absolutely not. You're taking a baby dose. There's no way that it could be the medication. But what it probably means, my dear Renee, is that this is a break. This is a breakthrough of your original problem. This is this is evidence that you need this medication. You are very sick, and the and the insomnia is coming back in. And so he'd say, this just means we need to raise your dose. So slowly over time, that 0.5 went to 0.75, from 0.75 up to one, from one to 0.25, and ultimately I ended up taking. Um, about 2.25 milligrams of clonopin, um, as always as prescribed, never more than the doctor prescribed, but that's a huge uptick. I believe it's like 400% increase over a seven year period. And so my baby dose really increased, but I would also say that was normalized by almost everyone because Again, my now ex-husband is a doctor and he would tell me he saw people taking 10 milligrams of clonopin. So, well, that was nothing if I was taking two milligrams. So that's part one. Part two, I was definitely part of a medical community as the wife of a doctor. You know, the story is everyone is taking something. And this was very true that many of the wives that I know were taking antidepressants, you know? And so there was a lot of normalization around that. And um, I guess the other thing is that, you know, I really did trust my doctors. And every time I went to go see any doctor for just a regular checkup, no one, not one doctor ever said to me when they, when they ask you at every appointment, what medications are you taking? No one ever said, hold on a minute you've been taking a medication for, you should, this is not, you know, a good idea. No one ever, not one bell whistle or red flag, not one in seven years. It's so difficult to be that voice of dissent, isn't it? It's so difficult when the peer pressure around you, your own family, your doctors, friends, extended acquaintances are, you know, normalizing that it's okay to be on the drugs long term. It's, it's, it's okay to take this dose. It's okay to take multiple drugs at a time. It's so difficult, isn't it, to dissent to that and say, no, this isn't right for me, particularly when you're vulnerable anyway. Yeah. And I, I really have to say that while I was on the medication, I believed that I needed that medication. 
you know, so I had already been gaslit into believing there was something wrong with me that I, you know, everyone in the whole family unit believed there was something wrong with me. I mean, I really was a bit of a scapegoat in, in my, in this family unit where, you know, there's something wrong. And so I, I was getting better, you know, and as long as I was taking the medication, everyone felt good that I was getting better. So I believed that as well. So it wasn't really even that I felt that there, I wasn't the voice of dissent. I, I was fully bought into that narrative, fully entrenched. So Renee, you, you know, you explained that you were getting, you know, dizzy spells and, you know, infections, and you started to wonder if, if it was the benzodiazepine that, that might be causing it. So h- how did you approach getting off it? Yeah, so I didn't approach getting off of it. <laughs> I, um, my story, it took a little turn one day in 2011. So the doctor who had been prescribing was prescribing me three months at a time. And he would just basically, in the in-between, he would um, send them to me. He would just send these prescriptions through the mail, or I guess his secretary would. And so one day I went in for one of my appointments and I was greeted by a note taped to the door. And the note basically said, uh, hello, patients of Dr. So-and-so, uh, your doctor is, is, is no longer uh, practicing. You know, please get in touch with your primary care physician to find a new provider. The only thing I really knew about this medication was that you really aren't supposed to miss a dose, you know, and So I called my primary care, the first person who prescribed ever. And he said, you better come in here right now because I know you can't miss a dose. So he got me right in and I sat down with him and he said to me, um, I said, I was very casual. I was like, you know, so my, I guess the doctor stopped prescribing. So I'm going to need somebody else. Can you, can you just write for me? And he looked at me and was like, yeah, no, I cannot write for you for this. And I went, really? You know, why? And he said, because you've been taking this a long time and you, you have a a dependency problem. And I went, what? And he said, you're going to need an addiction specialist. And I was like, what? You know, and he's like, because you you can't, these medications just can't be abruptly stopped. You're going to need somebody to help you get off of it. I was stunned. No one had ever said anything, including him. So um, he he did refer me and thank goodness he did refer me to the doctor who took me the rest of the way, Dr. Patricia Halligan, who I will mention, she is a big part of the Benzo Information Coalition. And so I met her and I, the very first time I met her, I was like, hey, so I've been taking this medication. I just want to, you know, kind of keep taking it. And if you can keep prescribing the way that my guy had, that would be really cool. And she sort of looked at me and just went, Right. So let's explain why you're here. (laughs) So she explained to me for the first time that I had been taking a medication that is among one of the most um, addictive medications and that I have become, my body has become dependent on it. And that if I wanted to continue to work with her, we would need to work to taper off of that medication. And I was like, great, let's do it. Um, I didn't have a young child anymore at this point. I didn't have that stress. He was sleeping through the night. I thought that that's all that it was. And she never scared me into thinking that there could be a problem. I really didn't understand what was involved with the tapering process, but I was good. I didn't want to be on a medication anymore. So... I'm so pleased to hear that you did find somebody knowledgeable because there are so many not knowledgeable practitioners out there that we yank somebody off for benzodiazepine really quickly. And then, of course, you go back and say, oh, I'm in hell again. And they, they say it's relapse. You know, they don't mention dependence because they just want to reflect it back on the person being treated. Yeah. And when you talk about that hell for real, like it's unfathomable and no one can see it. So you're, you know, you're shaking and you're crying and, and no one can really see these, these things. But yes, yeah, she under, she really understood and had, I was so fortunate to have found her and that's so glad that she's helping so many other people now and helping psychiatrists to de-prescribe safely for their patients. Yeah, absolutely. So Renee, what, what, what happened then as, as you got to, or was the end of your clonazepam taper? 
So things went for me, you know, people do ask me this question a lot. Like, did I have trouble during the actual taper? And quite honestly, Dr. Halligan was so terrific. She really let me lead. And so the idea was we would always be going down and never back up. But if I got a little bit twitchy or uncomfortable, I just held it, you know, I held it a little bit longer. So it was very patient driven. I didn't even know what that was, but that is what she allowed me to do. And it was fine. So I didn't have a ton of trouble during my taper, but at the completion of the taper, there was a little bit of confusion and I won't go into all the confusion there, but um, she had meant to have me continue to taper down using a water titration strategy. And that was not written out on the on the little yellow legal pad that she had given me. And she had gone out of the country for a month. And um, I just thought I was done. I had crossed over from the clonopin to Valium. I had gone down as low as I could. And at the very bottom of the little yellow pad of paper indicating, you know, what my dose would be. And I went, I'm done. And so I, I stopped and I, you know, was done. Well. For those of us who have been taking these medications, what we learn is that they have a very long half-life and they stay in your body for a long time. So um, I thought I was absolutely false sense of security. I remember the night that I finished, I bought a new dress. We went out to dinner to celebrate that I was done. About 10 days later, I really started to feel there's almost no word. I remember, you know what a kaleidoscope looks like, right? Like I remember feeling like the world tilted and had these edges around it. Now my ex-husband is an ophthalmologist and he was like, oh, you're having an ocular migraine. You know, that's what this is. And I was having a lot of visual stuff. And so I, you know, I didn't really, I didn't connect it. It's so strange, but I, I didn't connect this 10 day after thing. I thought I was just getting sick. And so, um, I, again, I I had that dizziness. I couldn't, the insomnia was back, the ringing in my ears, my eyes were dripping. And I started to have this inner, just this, this, this malaise, like a, like a, like a motor, like this thing. And it was very uncomfortable. And, And this is just at the 10 days off point. And, um, Shortly thereafter, the ne- probably the next day, I uh, went. I, w- I hadn't slept, and my husband. I could hear him banging around in the kitchen, and I went downstairs. And I was holding on to the walls, and I just said, "Something is not right. I, everything is too bright. Everything's too loud. I, I'm having a a problem." And um, I heard in my brain, I heard the sound that you would hear when like your air conditioning clicks on or off that that's that kind of a loudness. It it clicked three times. It went click, click, click. And I went down on the ground and I now understand that that, that's, that was a seizure. That was a seizure that I was having. And I fell on the ground and um, he, my ex went off to my now, my then husband now ex went off to work And um, I stayed there for most of the day, was finally able to crawl over to the couch where I kind of huddled under a blanket. And um, I was, that was my last, you know, that day prior was my last normal day because for years after that, I was bedridden and severely disabled as a result of that abrupt cessation of the, of the clonopin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if, if you read a lot about it, you find that benzodiazepines suppress seizures, you know, and that's that's one of the uh, their indications when they were first started to be used. But of course, your doctor doesn't tell you when you come to stop this drug, you might be at more risk of seizures because, you know, it, the drug has suppressed the seizure activity, even if you're not, even if you're not someone prone to them, you might experience it. How many of us would actually take these things if we were told that at the start? But it, it never enters the conversation, does it? Yeah. And I remember even asking about side effects the first time I re- not with my primary care, but when the psychiatrist prescribed, I remember saying, are there any side effects? And um, he said, no, it's tried and true. This is a very old drug, very good. And um, he, like I said, he said, you know, it might even lose a little bit of weight. So he really put a positive spin on it. There was not one mention of, of, of a negative side effect, which now just blows my mind. I mean, it just 
when you read the hundreds and hundreds of symptoms that a person can have that read like a terrible laundry list, I joke around that I had every single solitary one except erectile dysfunction, right? I mean, every single one. And it's not like you have one and then the others go away. They are simultaneous and nonstop, 24-7. You're holding a electric wire being electrocuted while someone's burning your hand on the stove, while some while you stubbed your toe, while someone's hitting you with a hammer over your head, while someone's poking you with a cattle prod. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I can't believe I survived it, but but I have. Yeah. And, and, and I think perhaps the cruelest thing is to expect people, you know, to deal with these this maelstrom of physical problems when the first thing that happens when you reduce many of these kind of drugs is your anxiety comes back a hundred times worse than it ever was because you you reconnect with your emotions and you're not used to experiencing them so this poor person is not only physically going through hell their anxiety about what they're going through is at a far higher level than they've perhaps ever experienced yeah. And I mean, it's my understanding that there actually really is a, it's like a chemical, you know, this is a chemically caused brain injury. You know, when you read literature about what people with brain injuries have, they have that light sensitivity, the sound sensitivity, the, the rocking, the, the insomnia. So there really is, some, even though it doesn't seem to be able to be picked up necessarily, we can't detect it somehow. It really is a real injury. There's a real injury there. But then yes, we are so dis disconnected from our bodies that these, these sensations, there's a pendulum swing of like for years of not feeling, and then it swoops the other way to make some kind of almost an overcorrection. So it takes a little bit of time to to get back to some kind of homeostasis where you can be like, okay, I feel my body, normal feelings again, not these crazy feelings. But I mean, I also had way more than just the physical sensations. There were psychological, um, it's terrifying. I, I had paranoia. I was agoraphobic. I thought people were trying to kill me. I mean, I had these auditory and visual hallucinations that came back. I heard trains coming and going at doors slamming when they weren't slamming. I remember always sort of trying to fall asleep during that really difficult time when you just cannot get any rest. And it just was like one door slamming after the other. And there were no doors slamming, you know? So um, if something is really injured when you're, when you're healing from, from this. And so, you know, you, you describe again really well in the book that the kind of hell that you went through over many years and, and that really had quite a serious impact on your family life, didn't it? Could you tell us about that? It did. So I just could not live in my home anymore. Um, my, my now ex-husband, then husband, he really didn't change anything in his life to try and help me with this. He really wasn't even curious about it. So he just kind of went back to work and left me alone for long, long periods of time. And I could not take care of myself. So I was not really able to take care of our home or our child. And um, so what ended up happening was uh, that I, I ended up reaching out to my parents and they live about an hour and a half away. And my father came to get me. He actually came into the house and um, he came and got me. I was upstairs in the bedroom and he carried me downstairs and brought me to their home. So I lost contact with my son for an extended period of time. He was going into ninth grade at the time, but I just, I needed more help and I wasn't getting it where I was must have been so difficult to, to be in the middle of all this and and you know be having family rifts and splitting apart with your loved ones too when you when you really need the, the most support possible but I hear so many people saying that families can't take what's happening to their loved one you know they, they they're all sorts going on there's there's guilt and there's denial and in some cases there might even be gaslighting or, or disbelief or you know pull yourself together but it, it it's it seemed to be at the worst possible time anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of a blind, there's big blind spots sometimes there. I know that I was always the person that people would come to with a problem. I was always the, per the strong one. I was a teacher. I was a mother. I, I, I ha I've always been able to handle a lot of balls in the air at the same time. I still, now that I 
and back. I, I am able to do that, you know, and multitask a bit. And, um, I think it was a, it was a bit of a shift because people always saw me as the strong, capable one. So she's going to be fine. You know, maybe I was being dramatic or something, but there was a, there was an inability for people to recognize how bad off I was. I found interesting in the book, I felt there was a bit of a theme that I detected. And obviously, the book will mean different things to different people according to how, you know, what bits they relate to. But to me, the more you got involved with the medical system and got on the medical conveyor belt, the more intense your difficulties became. But then there came a point where you, uh, you know, kind of started to rely on the kindness of strangers, almost who are not medical people. And that seemed to be a you know, paradigm shift in your kind of, you know, ability to trust yourself to deal with these things and to heal. So correct me if I'm wrong, Renee, I think it was a friend of yours that recommended a, a local wellness center that, that you kind of, yeah. Could you tell us about that? That's quite incredible. Shout out Regina Wright. <laughs> yes, my across the street from my parents. So I'm now living with my parents in Syracuse and um my friend, a childhood friend, it's so hard to explain this, but it took all my courage to walk across the street because everything was so bright and I was a mess. And I knocked on her door and I said, girl, I am a mess. Can I come in? I told her what was going on, that I had come off of this medication. She didn't flinch. She sat with me and she said, hmm, there's a, there's a really good wellness center nearby and um, maybe you could, maybe you could go there and maybe you could get a massage or they do acupuncture. Maybe they have a, they have an organic um, juicing thing or whatever. And she basically, she just tried to point me in a direction of, um, I think she even knew some people who had gone there who had really benefited from it. And it really was the shift because um, everyone else was sort of saying to me, please go back on this medication, please go back on the medication. And I had just gotten off of it after this long extended 10 month wean. And I just had some kind of internal guide or understanding that if I went to an emergency room, they were going to reinstate me. They were, or possibly I would have been put into a psych ward where I would might've been poly drugged again. And I just had to, I could not have that happen. So there was something guiding me that that, that got me across the street that that got me to Gina that got me to this uh, this wellness center and then where everything miraculous changed. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it did. It did seem to be, you know, the point that you started to trust your own truth and trust your intuition and and find resources within yourself that you perhaps couldn't access when you were, you know, being doctored or, or you know, medicalized, if you like. Yeah, it definitely involved asking for help, like shamelessly. I mean, I felt like I had always been asking for help, but to, obviously to the wrong people. I mean, it's just a whole wrong side. So I went to this place and it was just a, the, the, the massage was awful. I mean, it wasn't because the massage therapist was awful. It's just that I couldn't, I was too sensitive and I couldn't take the, the, the feel of uh, her hands on my skin. The, the lavender that she put on felt like it was burning me. So at the end of that session, I, I, I left very early because I couldn't take it. And I went to lean against the wall and wait for my father to pick me up because I couldn't drive at that time. And I was just sobbing and sobbing against this wall, of this brick wall. And I basically just thought to myself, this is it. This is it. I can't do this anymore. I've been doing this for a long time now. It had been over a, over a month or two months, I guess, since I'd been in the acute phase. And um, I just said, I can't do it. I just can't do this anymore. This is it. I, I have no function. I, I can't be a mother. I, I can't take care of a home. I can't read. I can't write. I can't drive. I can't get a massage. I'm like, I'm. I, what am I doing here? And I looked up at the top of the building and I thought, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump off the building. And I was sobbing and sobbing because I didn't really want to die. I just wanted the pain to stop. And this woman approached and she was in silhouette because the sun was behind her. And it just, in my memory of her, she looked like a princess. And it looked like there were feathers coming out of her hair. And she was wearing this white dress to the point where people have actually said from my book, they're like, was she real? Or was that like, was that like the sixth sense? You know, was she, was that a figment of your imagination? 
no, she was real. This is a real person approached me and she bent down and she said, are you okay? And I said, nope, I'm not okay. And she said, um, you know, I told her what was going on briefly. And she looked at me and she said, would, would you like to come home with me? I did not ask her name. I did not ask where she lived. I was going to jump off of a building. You know, it's like, if you're about to end it, like, okay, you know, this woman's going to take me home and chop me to pieces, make it quick, you know? So I, I, she put me in her car and I went home with her. And while we were in the car, she was telling me about what she does and where she lives and about her family. And she said, and if you're coming home with me, I should probably know your name. And I said, my, my name's Renee. And she said, oh, that's perfect. My name's Renee too. And it was truly a very powerful moment because my whole life, I probably only knew one other Renee, maybe. And um, this was really weird. And Renee means reborn in, in French. And it just was this very strange thing for both of us, for both of us. And I went home with her and it was the beginning of, it was the beginning of a total paradigm shift because she knew things. Um, she, as it turned out, she had been through something similar. She had healed herself from three illnesses and um, had been through several, you know, something similar. And she taught me a lot. Yeah, it, it was pretty incredible to read in the book that, you know, you, you clearly got to a point where you thought, there are no more options for help. I'm, I'm completely out of it. And perhaps the last thing you expected was to find it from the kindness of strangers. And, and you know, ultimately, you, you spent quite a, a bit of time with this family, didn't you? Yeah. And I would just say, coming from a house where all the books on our shelves were medical, you know, the DSM and all these things, I walked into her house and it was like, Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and The Body Keeps the Score, and like all these other books that I had never seen or heard of. And it was like a whole alternative parad you know, paradigm, parallel universe. I mean, The Matrix is real. You know, I came into a different world. And, and I just learned about juicing and about eating differently. And she helped me to get off. I was actually taking one other medication. I was taking Topamax because I, because I had, you know, they had decided I had migraine headaches. And so she helped to get me off of the Topamax while I lived with her. And it was just, it was just, she never asked for a penny. I mean, it was truly the, the kindness of strangers, but way beyond the kindness of strangers. You know, you, you, again, you you know, you talk about as you kind of emerge from your, you know, psychiatrized self and medicalized experiences, you know, you, you started to um, discover your creative spark again. You started to think about doing things that you hadn't thought about doing for a long time. And, you know, you, you described the changing relationship with both your son and, and your husband, who, of course, you're still in touch with. But, you know, obviously, you're moving to a different place. So, you know, what was kind of in your mind in those times about what? Because I, I imagine the future after spending some time with Renee looked quite different than it did the day you met her when you were sobbing against the wall, thinking this was probably the end of it. Yeah. Um, so fast forwarding. So after I spent a fair amount of time with Renee, I actually returned home to my husband and my son. And it really was, it was like looking and going, oh, it was really strange. It's still strange when I think about it, that the love was just not present. And I did not know what to do with that. And um I, we ended up going to marriage counseling for a time. And then I ended up going to uh, rehab. I ended up actually going to a rehab in Arizona um, where I learned a lot of, of trauma in about trauma informed therapy, which I had never had before. And it just was the framework for which everything snapped in my then husband came to the meadows in Arizona and um, participated in the um, family week experience. Very reluctantly, he came and um, we, we, we learned a lot about each other, but mostly we came out of it realizing we were wanted very different things for our lives, that we were very different, had very different needs and so when I returned shortly thereafter, um, 
I, I had, I had improved enough. So I was able to drive confidently and I was driving around one day and I saw this low rise building. I mean, I'd driven down this road a million times and there was this low rise building and it had one of those like feather vacancy, vacancy, you know, just flailing. And I looked at it and I went, huh. And I just stopped. And I, I mean, you know, there was a voice that sort of said to me, go take a look. And I, and so I stopped the car and I looked and I went, I think, I I think I need to do this. And it was so strange because my ex and I have talked about this many times. Neither of us ever, you know, we're both Jewish people. We believe that marriage is forever. And, and it never occurred to us ever that, that our marriage was ending. I just thought I was going to be living there for a time that um, I would go there to heal. It, it just, I always thought we would, we would work our way back together. And it just, you know, it was a slow realization that that's not really what the universe had in, in store for us. And like you said, we're still friendly, um, but we are, we have, we are very different people. So yeah, so I ended up going into this apartment, renting this apartment. It was for senior citizens and I lived there for mm, two and a half years. I was the youngest by about, oh boy, about 35 years from the next, you know, I was way younger than most people there, but it was such a good place to heal. It was, it was quiet. The people were lovely. They took me under their wing and I felt a lot of love from the community in that. It was very strange, but um, yeah, that was where I did a lot of uh, recuperating. And then in 2016, I was well enough to um, take a p- very part-time job at a community college working as a tutor in a, uh, in a lab for students with learning disabilities. And I was really nervous about it because I felt very disabled myself, but it was really helpful to put myself out there, even though it was so difficult, I definitely felt, I felt a sense of competency. It was confusing. How could I be so disabled and yet still be able to help other people? But it, but it, that's when I really realized this is invisible and other people are not experiencing me the way I'm experiencing myself. And and then shortly after that, you, you know, you describe kind of, you know, letting your artistic side come out and, and, you know, being, becoming interested in, enough in that to think about running a business. So while I was in rehab, I, there was an exercise that we did. We had to paint something. I went into the art room and I made this thing and then we were supposed to present them in group. I pulled up this thing and it was like very elaborate and everyone in my group kind of went, wow, that's really pretty. And then afterwards, one of the people from my groups that asked me to sell it to him, <laughs> and I was like, dude, you can't buy my recovery circle. That's my recovery. And he's like, well, I would buy, it's really pretty, you know? So long story short was, it was the first time that I um, saw myself as, you know, having this other thing that someone reflected back at me. And yes, when I left uh, the rehab, I came home and I started painting. I made something for that person. And um, I started making other things for other people, posting them on Facebook, just kind of like always letting people know what I was going through. That That's always my way, sort of like letting people know. I, I never bought into the stigma thing. I was not ashamed. I didn't feel like I did anything wrong. So I was like, you know, you know, I'm healing from this brain injury. Here's what I painted today. So slowly, slowly, organically over time, I developed somehow this business where, um, and it wasn't meant to be a business. It was a coping mechanism, right? Like, you know, but I, I started painting and, um, and people liked it and then people bought them. And, and, and that's where I am today. Now I, now I'm an, a, an artist and I, and I do shows. I'm one of those girls that sits in the white tents and I, um, I have a website and I teach art classes, but I also am back to teaching, um, memoir writing classes as well. So I, I'm teaching again, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing it in a different way that suits, suits both halves of me. So, um, you know, in the book, you say at 42 months off clonazepam, I can tell that I'm fi- finally healing. And, you know, I know myself from other interviews that it's perhaps quite difficult for people that have never been through it to accept that these experiences can go on this long you know they, they tend to have this view that you come off the drugs you have six months of turbulence and then maybe everything's fine but you know it, it the, these really long-term 
uh, journeys off the drugs are far more common than people realize, aren't they? Yeah, and I and I actually really do. That's why I frame it as a brain injury because if someone had a stroke, you don't expect them to be okay the day later or a week later even. So I try to frame it that way of like, it's a very weird injury in that it affects some kind of the brain where you're still able to talk and it's just weird. But there's this understanding that you're not okay. It's like a splitting. It's very odd. So whatever it is, yes, it does last a long time, but I am truly a firm believer. And this is why I really wrote the book, James, is that I really wanted people to understand I am, I don't want to be the poster child for benzodiazepine, you know, uh, healing, but I, I have mostly healed from this. I've healed far enough through this that from the outside, no one can tell from the inside. I have a little bit of stuff left, but I can coexist with it. And my neuro neuroplasticity is amazing. Your brain can heal. You will not be where you are in three years where you were at three weeks and you won't, and, and at nine years, you won't be where you were at six years. It, it does continue to change and in, in my experience, improve. And I've talked to a lot of people at this point who also have experienced that, that you can heal. Everyone's story is different. I can't tell you the timeline. I can't tell you it will be the same timeline as mine. It probably won't be, but you will not be the way you are at the where you were at the beginning. It, it will change. And um, so you just have to hold on and wait for the miracle and try and find something to do that makes you feel productive, constructive, useful while you're in it. And, and that's really what the art was for me, was just something to move the time. And some people bake and some people hook rugs and some people garden and some people pick up trash. Yeah, some people do podcasts. Some people do podcasts. Everyone's thing that we find is different, but it's whatever it is to bring purpose and awareness, hopefully, to this to this issue is what I think. Absolutely. That, Renee, that brings us on really nicely to kind of looking back on your experiences. Is, is there advice that you'd give others on who might have had tra tra traumatic experiences in their lives and end up in front of a doctor, you know, how, how could they avoid the prescribing cascade and poor treatment that you were subjected to? Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you for this question. So, I mean, I could have filled an hour on this one, but I guess I would say this. I understand the desire to go down that shoot, the psychiatric shoot, because that's very traditional in this culture, but there really are other healing modalities that exist. And the most important thing I think is to re is to really look at what is going on in your life that is making you want to go toward psychiatry or, you know, these pills in the first place. Is it a job that you don't like? Is it a, uh, is there a relationship that's causing you stress? Like what's actually happening here? Because that needs to be looked at. That's the first most important thing is what's driving you toward the insomnia, the whatever, whatever it is. Um, there seem to be two roots, by the way. I've seen people come to benzos through like a physical injury where they've, 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 um, they've hurt their back or something. And then someone prescribes a benzo for sleep because they can't get the, you know, the pain's keeping them up. So that's through a physical injury. I would encourage people there to be looking for some other kind of relaxation solutions. Then there's the people who come at this for um, the other wing, which is the emotional distress, but either way it's distress. And so what I have found are things like getting really good therapeutic massage I have found um, cranial sacral massage is a really great thing. There's something called for, for emotional trauma, there's something called SRI. And this is what Renee really taught me. It's somato respiratory integration. I'm not going to pretend to know everything about it, but what I can tell you is it has to do with breath work. It is a very specific patterned um, series of breath work exercises that work to bring you back into your trauma so that you're agitated in the way that you were there. But what happens in trauma, as I understand it, is we have that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. 
It brings you back into that. And then it allows you to not do whatever maladaptive mechanism you did, not freeze, not do that, not get stuck. It allows you to process it in the moment as the emotion is coming up. So um, you can release it. So when I did this work with Renee, for example, some people call it somatic experience. I've seen it SE, some people. When I when I processed that rape in this way, gone, never felt activated or agitated about it again. It just released it. Peter Levine writes about this, about how animals have this shake off response that humans don't have. And anyway, it somehow is just a release of energy. And I did it with that one trauma and we went all the way back and did it for multiple traumas that I mentioned earlier that I had experienced. It is costly, but it is the way out, you know, as opposed to losing years of income and losing my quality of life and losing my family system. I wish that I had known about this way before Also, I really am a huge fan of dialectical behavioral therapy. DBT should be taught in schools. That would be the kind of first step is dialectical behavioral therapy. You know, there's some other really weird things, which are people need to look at what they are eating. I mean, these are simple things, what they're eating, their diet. If you're eating a lot of junk going in, you're not going to sleep well at night. So diet is important to look at exercise. So many of us are sitting in front of our, at our desks, you know, and you've got to get outside, got to get some sunshine, get some exercise. And this has to become part of a a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle change. So usually what I say is if you're experiencing insomnia, you have to be willing to consider a lifestyle change. And if you don't want to do it now, trust me, you're going to have to do it later if you get involved with these medications. So do it now or do it later. I strongly recommend deal with the core issue rather than keeping a secondary problem on top of that first issue. Thank you, Renee. That's really helpful. And and then for any doctors or psychiatrists that might be listening to this, what should we be doing differently when prescribing dependence-forming drugs like benzodiazepines? Yeah, so I actually have a, a two-pronged thought to this. Um, there are people who are on these drugs now that cannot be abruptly stopped. I mean, we just, I know that a lot of doctors are doing this right now. They, the, somehow this message is starting to seep out, you know, that these medications are causing problems. And so doctors are saying, whoa, I don't want to prescribe this for you anymore. That is not the answer either. So first thing is, if someone's taking these medications, it would be to find the Ashton manual online. It is a free manual. You can find it at benzoinfo.org, Benzo Information Coalition. I just hope that psychiatrists will be open to the fact that patients have access to this information and that there really is a way to slowly wean people off of these, you know, taper people off of these medications, um, which is always going to be better than abruptly stopping someone. So that's the first bit of advice is you can't just stop people um, the way people are telling us to stop, which is cut it in half, cut it in half again in another two weeks, and then you should be fine. That is madness. Please go to the Ashton Manual and inform yourselves and have enough humility to think that maybe you don't know everything. Maybe, you know, maybe you learned something, you learned a lot of stuff during your residencies, but this is new information. New information comes out, right? There was a time where we thought the world was flat. We know better now. There was a time we thought these drugs were the way. We know better now. So, so, so just have a little humility. I guess the second thing though is If a patient comes your way and they haven't yet started these meds, please exercise greater caution with your prescription pads. I truly am one of these people who believes that benzos should not be prescribed outside of a a surgical setting. They have a function. If you're going to have a surgery, um, you need something so that you don't feel the pain. You know, there's a function to them but they really should not be prescribed long-term. So I guess my advice to a psychiatrist who's thinking about prescribing a benzo, please, that's not the way. I mean, I, that's really, I'm very black and white about it. As someone who was injured, I know that 
these medications, sometimes people need a, a something so they can pick themselves back up. You know, they, they might need something, but please just not a benzo. It's a slippery slope. And the new, um, per the new guidelines from the FDA in 2020, uh, these, uh, there's been acknowledgement that these drugs uh, can cause seizures and that they can cause dependency in as little as two weeks. You are, you were doing someone harm if you write for longer than a day or two. So why would you, you know, a week or two. So why would you even want to introduce someone to that? I call it in my book, a deal with the devil. So I guess my summate, summative sentence is just don't, don't be the one to start somebody. Absolutely. Thank you, Renee. And, and as we kind of come towards the end, um, you know, of this interview, I just wonder whether there was anything else that you, struck you that we should share with the listeners. I actually feel hopeful now that coming out of this, that that we are in a paradigm shift. And um, so people who are in it, just know that you were, you were in it for a reason and you're, you can come out of it. Just have faith, hold on, read information about what it is to have a brain injury and be patient with yourselves. Be so gentle and patient with yourselves. Talk to yourselves the way you would talk to a child who is, is injured or sick. We have to be patient and say, you know, rest, drink, sleep, take care of yourself and you'll be okay eventually just to please be patient with yourselves because too many people are taking their lives as a result of this injury. And it's just, it is patience. That is the message over and over again. Love yourself, be patient with yourself. You will eventually get better than you are today. I believe it. Fantastic. Thank you, Renee. Com compassion has to go both ways, doesn't it? For the person helping us, but also us for ourselves, trying to heal from something pretty significant. Yeah. And having talked to almost 500 people at this point, I hear it that people just don't exercise that compassion for themselves. We are human beings, not human doings. And we, we need to get better just being just being still with ourselves. And, and that is what this it takes to heal from this injury is just, I'm just going to make it through this day. That's all I have to do. That's my only charge is to make it through this day. I, I, I guess what I would also add though, and you know, I really do want people to understand my life though, is it's not perfect on this side, right? Like I did go through a divorce. Um, I am single. <laughs> it was very hard to go through COVID alone without anyone when people were not even letting you in at all. Um, it's been really challenging, but I, I can have a hard time, but I, I just, I never thought of myself as a strong person, not like this. Renee, it's been so eye-opening and, and amazing to to hear about your experiences. You know, I have to say the book, you know, I, as I said at the start, it's so beautifully written, uh, but describes such awful experiences. Uh, but there's so much hope in it too, from the, you know, the person that you were at the start of the experience to the person that you became at the end and all that you've achieved and, you know, all that you've learned and the help that you've given to others and you became a peer support counsellor and, and all the other things. You know, I, I'm so grateful to to get you on. Thank you, James. Well, I just want to thank Renee so much for joining me for the podcast. I highly recommend that you read her book, Psychiatrized, because while it does talk about psychiatric drugging and withdrawal, it covers so much else besides and offers real hope for those that might be on a similar journey off benzodiazepines. If you want to find out more about Renee, her website can be found at rasjacobson.store. That's R-A-S-J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N dot S-T-O-R-E. And here you can purchase her book, and she also offers a blog, as well as showcasing her artwork and so much more. Her book is also available from Amazon.com, in print, and for Kindle devices. So thank you so much for listening today. Please subscribe to this and our Mad in America Science News podcast too. So until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views and updates.